Lee, and thank you for joining us for this interactive fireside chat. The session will be recorded and posted on iLeader website and on YouTube as well. And my name is Gioric Guimarães, and I'm a law student at, at University of Fortaleza in Brazil. Just, just a quick technical note, we are using this webinar format in Zoom, so you will note everyone's camera are disabled. For this session, we are taking new questions for the discussion. The chat function works, so I encourage all of you to use that if you want to ask something and engage with your colleagues. On the chat, you can also find the link for the following session and the full conference program. Uh, so uh, the key issues of labor and employment law and unsafe working conditions at Fiera Foods Inc. in Toronto will be discussed. We have two amazing speakers with us today, and I would like to introduce you Dr. David Dury. He is a professor of work law at York University and visiting research fellow at Harvard Law School's labor and work life program during 2019 to 2020. He is the director of the executive LLM in labor and employment law at Osgood Hall Law School and editor of the Canadian Law of Work Forum blog. He was educated at the University of Toronto, BA, London School of Economists, LLM Labor Law and Osgood Hall Law School, PAG. I also would like to introduce you, Sarah. She is a STARS Work and Wealth reporter. Sarah reports on the changing workplace, including precarious work, labor issues, and workers' compensation. Her work at STARS has been recognized by the Human Foundation Prize for Social Justice Oriented Investigative Journalism. She received the GHR Canadian Association of Journalists Award for Human Rights Reporting in 2017. Sara is the writer and host of the podcast Hostel about gig work and the, and the struggle of food oil drivers to form of union in Toronto. I also want to encourage all of you to check the start podcasts in the Canadian Law of Work and submit articles. Now, I'm going to give the floor to Professor Dory, and thank you everybody and enjoy it. All right, thank you very much, Derek. So uh, as Derek said, I'm, I'm uh, David Dory and I'm a labor law professor up at York University in Toronto. And I, and I know that we have some uh, people listening in who are not Canadians and not Torontonians. So I thought I'd start with just a little, introduction to who Sara is and uh, why she's so important to our community here in the city and, and across Canada. Um, and Sara has, uh, so the Toronto Star where Sara works is the largest circulation newspaper in the country. And Sara has become somewhat of a celebrity here in the labor relations community, uh, which I'm sure she never really thought she would uh, become that uh, um, and when uh, Jen Harmer asked me to um, address the um, graduate symposium for ILERA, uh, I thought that it would be more interesting to do sort of an interactive, uh, what I call fireside chat, rather than have me uh, stand up at the front and lecture to, to everyone about uh, Canadian labor and employment law. Um, and at the time, I thought we might actually be in a nice room at, uh, at Ryerson or the University of Toronto where there would be a you know, nice fire behind us. Um, and of course, uh, the plague has hit us since then and we are doing this uh, virtual uh, fireplace chat, but I, uh, I found a picture of a fireplace for the slide there um, so we can feel comfortable. Um, and um, when I uh, was uh, floated this idea of a fireside chat, the person I had in mind was, was Sara. And um, she's the obvious choice. Uh, and thankfully, she was available uh, to do it and willing to do it. So I want to say a few words about Sara's work, um, especially for those of you who aren't from Toronto and Canada. Um, now, I have a little few slides here, and really, I, the only reason I put them together is to demonstrate sort of the, the breadth of Sarah's work and the sorts of things that she covers. So 
I'll just sort of flip through a few of them as I'm as I'm talking. Um, now, I guess what I what I want to start with is the idea that a lot of you listening will understand as graduate students studying work and labor issues, and that is that studying labor issues and writing about them is not easy. It's not an easy field. Uh, and just, you know, starting out right at the beginning with the question of how do you know what to look at and how do you know what to study? There's so many things that you could look at, so many issues to take on. So where do you even begin? Um, and I know Asara would have had to deal with this coming in as a labor reporter and all of you as graduate students in the field, you're, you're dealing with the same issue. What do I write my thesis on? What do I write my PhD on? Where do I start? How do I do it? Um, and so there's so many challenges that overlap between what Sara, I, I assume Sara has to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis and what graduate students in the field are dealing with. Just things like, um, you know, how do you get information? Um, who's going to talk to you? Will they trust you? Uh, will employees talk to you? Will employers talk to you? Um, how do you get hold of information that people don't want you to see? I know that Sara probably spends uh, uh, an inordinate amount of time filing freedom of information request and, and fighting that process. And as graduate students, we have to figure out our own ways to get a hold of information um, as well. Um, and the other thing that really strikes me about um, this field we're all in is that you really need to be multidisciplinary. You, you need to understand um, something about a whole range of disciplines. I mean, you know, law, um, economics, psychology, um, sociology, history sometimes, uh, geography. Um, all of these things, uh, those of us who are in the field doing this for a living as academics, we, we all have, these fields all overlap and we need to learn about all of them to a more or lesser degree depending on what uh, our focus is. Um, so we know how complex all of this is and some of us spend decades learning it, like seriously, decades learning it. Um, and yet we expect a journalist to be able to walk in and start writing stories about this stuff um, and to understand the issues at a high level and to speak on them, of them in a, in a complex level that really uh, explains the issues. Um, and often without any formal academic training in the field. Um, we'll talk a little to Sarah about with Sarah about her her background, but um, I think it's safe to say that Sarah doesn't have a PhD in uh, labor studies or any of the things that our audience are studying right now. Um, and so that's that's a really interesting thing that we expect our uh, journalists to do. Uh, but the great labor journalists figure it out, uh, and they do a great job. And what's even more impressive about the great ones in which I include Sara is that they're able to take this complexity uh, and translate it into real life personal stories uh, that make the issues real and relatable to a mass audience in a way that us scholars uh, either uh, don't even try to do or we're not very good at it. In other words, they, you know, someone like Sara can take a really complicated story about how regulation is failing migrant workers and turn it into a personal piece about actual workers who live this day to day and the challenges they're facing uh, in a way that someone can pick up the newspaper and read and understand the issues um, in ways that us law professors really struggle with sometimes, you know, writing our 50 page papers on the history of legal regulation. Uh, and sometimes we forget and we can learn from people like Sara as to how to tell a story, right, how to make it real. Um, and so uh, week after week, Sara is pumping out these articles and each one of them are just, it's just incredible the amount of knowledge that she demonstrates for someone without a background in this field. And so for those of you who haven't read any of her work, um, I suggest you Google her when we're done and just sit down and pick any story. And some of them are just, uh, you know, go deep in depth and it's just really incredible. And so I think we're honored to have someone like Sara join us in an academic conference. Um, and so what I want to do is um, sort of walk, I get to, I get to put on the interview hat and flip, flip spots with Sara today where I get to interview her. Uh, and this is going to be a lot of fun for me. And so 
Uh, we're just going to have kind of a freewheeling discussion. I have, I have some basic areas I want to cover, but uh, we'll see. We might end up going off tangent. And I know there's been some questions sent in, and there might be others, and we'll see if we can get to some of them uh, as we go. Okay, so with that long-winded background, um, Sarah, um, I think maybe it makes sense to really start at the beginning, if we could. Um, if you know, this crowd are mostly academics. They're master students, PhD students. Uh, I think we have some other people from the public who have joined in. But um, I know that your story about how you became a labor reporter at the Toronto Star is quite a meandering one. I, I, I recall it has something, it starts somewhere with the BBC. Um, but because we're dealing with graduate students, I'd actually like to go maybe even a little further back and talk about where you studied, like how you even got into journalism in the first place, and maybe sort of walk us through that back to sort of how, what you studied and how you ended up at the Toronto Star. Sure. Um, well, I did my undergrad uh, at the University of Toronto and I did peace and conflict studies. Um, and at that point, I actually thought I wanted to be a lawyer. Um, uh -huh and uh, I was interested in doing human rights law. And then somewhere along the line, I just sort of decided that, you know, I, I wanted a job where I had some outlet for creativity. You know, I love, I like writing, um, I like storytelling, um, and, I, and I wanted to have an outlet for that in what I did. Um, but I also knew the field of journalism was really hard to get into. I didn't really have much practical experience. Um, so I ended up doing my master's um, at the London School of Economics, um, uh, studying comparative politics, which uh, was a field that you know, I really didn't know anything about. Um, but I've forgotten that you went to the London School of Economics. Yes, yeah. Um, and yeah, so again, like didn't have any much practical um, uh, impact on my journalism career, but um, I, I sort of just started writing freelance for some organizations in London and, and just kind of starting to practice writing. Um, and uh, I, I just so happened into uh, an um, unpaid internship at the time. I lived with a family member um, and worked at a British news channel for a few weeks um, as an intern. And it, you know, it, it so happened that uh, a, the most junior person in the company quit while I was there and they desperately needed someone uh, to, to work as an, edit, uh, an editorial assistant. Um, so again, not really practicing my journalism chops, but um, it was my first kind of inroad into a newsroom and I kind of learned from the bottom up how to be a, a journalist on the job. Um, and after a couple of years of doing that, I moved out to Nairobi to work for a newspaper there for a year and then got the job at the BBC uh, with the African service. Um, and so I was traveling back and forth from London to um, uh, a number of different countries uh, around Africa. Um, so I, all this to say, I had absolutely no experience uh, academically in either journalism or labor studies. Um, but when I saw the posting at the Toronto Star for this job, um, I, I had always known that I wanted to come back to, to Toronto um, I was a little bit disillusioned about sort of my previous hopes of being a foreign correspondent and really questioning and interrogating the role that foreign correspondents kind of play in, in, uh, in Western media. And so I, I wanted a beat that would bring me closer to home and, and that's sort of what appealed to me about this job. And so what was the ad posted? Was it actually the labor and wealth reporter ad? It was, yeah, it was the work and wealth which I had no idea what that meant. And frankly, I don't think the star did either. Um, but I think the general guiding principle was sort of, um, it was a labor beat, but they, they wanted to update it. And 
the star had had a, a long history of labor reporters, but the position had been vacant for a couple of years. The newsroom was constricting because of financial restraints. Um, but they wanted a role to sort of look at the way that work has changed. Um, and traditionally, the labor beat at the star really did focus on sort of uh, union politics. Um, and I think the idea was really to expand that coverage to focus more on workers. And, and usually when I describe my beat now, um, I, I describe reporting on worker issues. And I think that's probably the best encapsulation of what I do and what other reporters in the US who have you know, a similar type beat do. That's kind of the spirit of what we do. Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, my first few months at the Star were really, I remember the, literally the first day I got there, my editor being like, so what is this seat exactly? What are you supposed to do? And I was like, I have no idea. Um, and it took a lot of kind of flailing around to kind of land on, um, you know, what my priorities for, for the beat were, and it took, took some time to, to build that out. But, um, you know, I, I really did it by um, spending a lot of time listening really to what uh, folks in the grassroots organization, the legal clinics, um, those were really the biggest sort of sources of information for me in terms of how I learned about the beat and, and the reason I think that those groups are so important is because, you know, they, they see the trends, they see the impact of legislative loopholes before anyone else does, you know, before a big law firm, um, you know, files a, a, a flashy class action suit, um, you know, the folks in the legal clinics are seeing individuals come in and starting to piece together what might become, you know, a, a picture of something more systemic that's happening. And so they were really key in, in kind of informing um, my process of, of learning about this beat. That's, you know, so I, I had a question coming up in my little order, but we, we're going to jump ahead because you've already addressed it, which is uh, one of the things that's really interesting about your work is that you... Uh, you haven't done historically what labor reporters have done, which, as you said, was a focus on collective bargaining and issues in, you know, giant manufacturing plants and the steel mills. And, and if you go back in time and you look at the labor reporters, that's what they worked. It was mostly men working on men's issues, right? Uh, large manufacturing plants. And as I'm asking this question, I'm going to shoot through some of these slides for the, for the people watching, just to give you a sense of what Sarah writes about. Um, you know, so um, I'll put a few of them up here, but uh, so this is, um, you know, WSIB issues you've spent quite a bit of time on, which is, you know, for any of you, any of us who are in the field, it's just infuriating dealing with workers' comp issues. Um, and you've really highlighted a lot of those issues that come out. Um, issues of, um, you know, here's an example of a legal clinic, one of the legal clinic issues that you're talking about and the struggles of retail workers and, and just basic labor standards issues. Um, migrant workers and the challenges they're facing. Um, long care, long-term care workers. And there's a pattern, um, injured workers, um, older workers, younger workers, um, immigrant workers, women. Um, there's a trend in your writing and what the trend is that I've always noticed, which struck me just as someone who's been around for a while, that um, your focus, your beat is people who primarily people who have, who are outside of the mainstream labor movement, for instance, they have not benefited from collective bargaining. They have not benefited from unions. They depend in terms of law on labor standards and regulation. And yet they're falling through those cracks because the enforcement mechanisms are terrible. Uh, sometimes the laws are terrible. Sometimes the laws are decent on the paper, but they're not being enforced. Um, and that's really where you zoned in. And I thought that was really interesting. And, um, and one of the questions I had for you, which you've now started to answer already was, was that a conscious choice? to really focus in on precarious work and uh, not what we call non-standard work in, in, in our academic world. Um, now you've hinted a little, that the answer was a little bit uh, 
when you got to the job itself, the Toronto Star had this idea that it needs to change. Um, but then, so how much of, of this, the fact that you ended up what, you, what your beat is, um, was a, you know, that's what you were told to do or how much of it was once you got out talking to the people in the clinics, you found that's where the interesting stories are? Yeah, I mean, I really wasn't, I wasn't told anything when I started. Again, like I think there was, um, there was some vague higher level ideas about what the beat would look like, but on the ground, you know, no one really had a, 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 um, a concrete vision of what that would look like. So in some ways that was intimidating, but it was also wonderful because I got to carve it out um, as I saw fit really. Um, and, you know, there was a, there was a prior legacy there, reporters like um, Lori Montbratton, who's our social justice reporter, um, had done some wonderful in-depth stories on precarious work. But, you know, precarious work really was, um, as, I, as I talked to folks on the ground, the, the issue that came to the fore. And I was really struck at how, you know, these precarious working arrangements impacted every area of people's lives. You know, it wasn't just about um, being in a low wage job and not being able to feed your family. It was about, you know, your ability to interact with your community and the sense of isolation that comes along with precarious jobs. And it was about who is more likely to be in precarious jobs. And again, obviously we know that that is, you know, it's more likely to be women of color. Um, and so, yeah, it was a conscious decision. It was a conscious decision to focus on the most vulnerable um, and to ask how and why our existing kind of regimen, um, you know, who it excludes and why. Um, and I, you know, I think it's interesting in this moment where we're having such a reckoning in mainstream media about whose, whose voice is included in, in mainstream coverage. And so it, it was for me early on a conscientious choice to say, look, you know, I want to use the seat to make space for workers and voices who are, are not just excluded from mainstream media coverage, but often excluded from policy discussions um, at the sort of governmental level, um, who are often not unionized and not, not a part of the traditional kind of labor movement, as you say. Um, and, you know, I think we're seeing changes on that front for sure. But, um, you know, I think part of journalism's role and what the power of journalism is, 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 to, is to make space for those voices. And I, and I think that's part of our mandate really as journalists. Yeah, it's interesting because there is a movement within academia as well to shift focus towards the sorts of issues that you're dealing with. And in a way, you would have thought it would have been um, an obvious thing that we should stop focusing so much on collective bargaining and manufacturing and mining and really look at all the people who, who collective bargaining is irrelevant to them. Um, and we've always had people talking about that. You know, we, and in my field, in, in the law field, for instance, Judy Fudge um, has been talking about, you know, she wrote her famous paper, uh, Labor Law's Little Sister, um, years ago um, about how really women are mostly left out of collective bargaining. And it's they're, the only thing that protects them is employment standards and nobody cares about employment standards. Now you care about employment standards um, and increasingly um, academics have started to look at that, but it's really only recently, you know, and uh, in a way there's, a, there's an interesting uh, chicken and egg thing here about at least in Toronto, to the extent to which even your writing has influenced a new generation of people to start being interested in these things, because you were able to take these issues and put them in, in the public space. Um, if you just, I'll, I, it's an academic thing, so I have to throw in at least one graph uh, because I know we don't have all Canadians here, but just in terms of context, um, this is a chart of union density. Um, and if we followed it back even further, what we would see is that private sector union density in Canada has been falling since the 1980s. It used to be up in the mid thirties. And now we're looking at about 16, 15%, uh, depending on where you are, private sector. The blue line is public sector. 
So they're in the public sector, unions are still very strong and the vast majority of public sector workers are unionized. But that's also not an area that you're really focused in on, Sarah. You're not, you don't have a lot of articles on public sector workers. You're dealing with the private sector and the private sector is that red line and it's falling. So right now about 84% of private sector workers in Canada are non-union. And for most of them, unless the laws change, which is one of the issues you talk about as well, they're never going to be covered by collective bargaining, right? They, they need a whole other system. And so that story has always been there. Uh, never in the history of Canada have, have the majority of workers been unionized. And yet in academia, the unionized sector grabbed probably 80% of the attention and it's starting to change. Um, you know, and I do think that you're, you and others like you who are writing about these stories. I mean, you, for instance, you know, I worked at a legal clinic in Toronto uh, 25 years ago in Parkdale uh, in the labor rights division. And these issues that you're talking about were there then, but there was no strong voice, um, you know, raising these issues, getting them out to the public. And so the, there wasn't as much attention on those issues. Um, okay, we'll come back to some of these points in a minute. I wanna ask you, I wanna bring in one question that was asked uh, by several people on Twitter last night, and it was also something I was gonna ask you, so I'll bring it in. I'll use, I'll use Jim Stanford's question, which I know you know Jim. Jim Stanford uh, is the director of the Future of Work Center and a famous, if we, is there such a thing as a famous labor economist? That would be Jim. Um, he asked, uh, he says, please ask Sarah about the future of labor journalism in Canada. She does a uniquely wonderful job and has exposed so many critical stories, but the labor beat exists almost nowhere else. Why is that? And what can be done to promote and support journalists in that realm? Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I think since I started this beat, that question has weighed more and more on my mind because being in it, I can't understand why an organization would not want someone dedicated to this, this issue. I mean, obviously, as we're seeing now, um, you know, I think COVID has really highlighted why is it, it's essential, but, um, you know, workplace issues, they affect all of us. You know, everyone knows what it feels like to have a bad boss. Um, there are stories that are relatable. They're incredibly important. Um, and, um, you know, I, I, I just, I think it's a fascinating topic. Um, I mean, I think that it's been on the decline for a number of reasons. The star has a kind of historical affinity for this issue. I don't know, you know, some people may not know the history of the star, but um, we were founded um, in the late uh, 19th century by a group of um, print men on strike from what is now the Globe and Mail. Um, and the initial kind of ethos of the paper was to be a, you know, a sort of paper for the working person. Um, and that's a key part of our, our mandate and our Atkinson principles that guide, you know, our kind of editorial vision, um, the rights of working people. And so um, it's part of it, our DNA is a newspaper. And so, um, you know, for us, I, I think it, it made sense to keep the beat alive. Um, I remember when I first started having a copy with Lauren Slotnick, who was the Globe and Mail's uh, last labor reporter, who is now a arbitrator at the labor board. Um, but he was essentially shuffled out of that job, uh, I think, in the 90s. Um, and I think it, you know, part of it uh, goes back to who are the gatekeepers, you know, in all institutions, including media. And I think in a lot of cases, the gatekeepers are people for whom um, unions are not interesting at the very best. Uh, at worst, they're, you know, a threat. Um, they're people who may not have, well, almost never have lived experience as a, you know, a low wage racialized worker in the workforce. Um, and so there's a blind spot there. Um, I do think that for younger people, we're starting to see a change when you look at a lot of the kind of digital media outlets coming up in the US, they do have labor, you know, labor reporters or, or workers who are reporters who focus exclusively on worker issues, you know, have post vice and they're breaking, um, you know, 
stunning stories about Amazon, um, you know, and, and the gig economy and, you know, all the you know, major players in, in that realm. And I think for many of us um, who have grown up in a world where, you know, it's very difficult to get a stable nine to five job with benefits and a pension, that's instinctively something we recognize as a important story. And so I think we are starting to see a shift. Um, in yeah. Canada, it's been a little bit slower, I think, because we don't have the, um, you know, our media scene is just not as rich as it is in the U.S., although obviously the, the industry everywhere is in crisis. Um, right. But, you know, I was really heartened um, a couple years ago when the Star expanded and opened some bureaus across the country and sent a bunch of young reporters out there and asked them what kind of beats they wanted to focus on. Um, a number of them uh, chose to focus on labor issues. Um, and, you know, and so I think, uh, I think we will see a change. Um, I think we will see more reporters starting to focus on this and as part of their daily school. Yeah, and it could be, and I think you, you would have played a big part in that. I mean, you're, this isn't gonna be like a, the SARA award show, but, uh, but almost all of your stories are front page now. I mean, that, you know, that's just, you've taken a story that used to, a, a beat that used to be buried in the back and put it right on the front page. Um, and you should be proud of that. And, uh, um, and it doesn't surprise me of young journalists coming up, look at you as a hero um, and want to follow in your footsteps. So congratulations to you, but also thank you for all of us, right? Cause you're putting our, what we do out there too, right? I'm going uh, on the work that you guys do, so. Yeah, yeah. Um, so you've covered some pretty horrible workplaces. Uh, you know, a lot of your stories are about horrible workplaces and horrible working conditions. And no doubt, um, uh, Fiera Foods is uh, up there on that list. Um, and so for those of you who are not Torontonians, Fiera Foods is a, a large industrial bakery in North Toronto. And Sara went undercover there a few years ago. I don't know. Here's your, your little story, uh, your front page. And it's an incredible piece, um, a long, in-depth piece. Um, and a, it's a really interesting story, and I wanted to spend a bit of time on it. I know you've talked a lot about it, um, but um, what I want to know, a couple of things. One, let's maybe right at the beginning. How did the story come about? I mean, how did Fiera Foods get on your radar, um, first of all? Let's just start there. Yeah. Um, well, and thank you for for all the nice all the nice things you've said. I, I will say that um, for every front page story, there's probably five stories that um, were buried somewhere in the paper, and editors didn't really care about, and didn't probably didn't think were important. And there were dozens of stories like that um, that led me to the fear of food story. So if there is anyone out there watching this who is considering a career in journalism, I would say do not give up on your little two-bit stories that don't get great play because they, they, that is what lays the groundwork for journalists to cover something bigger. Um, and so I had, you know, I'd heard uh, just talking to workers, interviewing, you know, tons of workers for, for, again, stories that often didn't get great placement. I would hear about the way that the most dangerous tasks um, in, a, in a workplace were often downloaded onto temp agency workers. Obviously, I was covering um, a ton of stories about the workers' compensation system, and, and um, as part of that, kind of began to see how um, uh, temp agency workers you know, had particular struggles to, to get their injuries recognized um, uh, or to get appropriate time to recover. Um, so that had all sort of started to coalesce in my mind. And then I read a academic uh, research paper out of the US uh, that had looked into, um, they'd done a statistical analysis that had shown that temp agency workers were, um, uh, I think twice as likely to get injured on, on the job um, as, as directly hired permanent workers. And so I wanted to know if the same thing could be said of uh, temp agency workers here in Canada um, and quickly realized that we don't keep the type of statistics 
that allow us to quantify that. Um, and so I, I couldn't rely on academic research here. So I just began by going through court bulletins that the Ministry of Labor issues when they convict an employer. And I, and I went and read hundreds and hundreds of them and basically isolated all the ones where the worker involved was a temp agency worker. And one of those uh, facilities that was prosecuted and convicted was Sierra Foods. Um, and I, I, I just remember Googling them and I found a case on Canley, which is our um, database of legal decisions that involved the same facility. And it was, a, it was a, a horrifying story to me that encapsulated the dangers associated with precarious work. Um, and so just sort of my gut said, you know, I think there's something here. I think there's something happening at this facility um, that may be an illustration of, you know, the larger problems that we're seeing around um, temp, temp agency work. Um, and, and that's, that's how I started digging into it. And I, you know, I, I did probably six months, if not more of research. Um, before we decided that given the precarity of the work, the fear of reprisal for workers speaking out, you know, the best way to tell the story was for me to go and get a job there and that, you know, there was a, a compelling public interest piece in doing that. And, uh, and oh, was it, was it your, your idea to go undercover? It, it was my idea. Obviously, it was, um, you know, after I proposed it, that that's a decision that the, the final decision comes after, you know, conversations with your law, with the STARS lawyers, with, you know, the highest level management. Okay. We had a big conversation about it and decided that, yeah, you know, this is the, the best slash only way to effectively tell this story. And there, there is a public interest here in, in, in doing this. That's interesting because it's one of the things I wanted to ask you because the, for academics, for the students listening, um, to go undercover, like we, you know, when we do these research projects, we have to go through an ethics committee. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I think I've talked to you about this before, and because I had an idea for a project that kind of stalled. I'd still like to go back to it, but it involved basically trying to get a hold of workers coming in and out of a factory and standing there. And they, I ran into some ethics issues um, that just being there could put those people at danger, at risk. And so I've I had to sort of step back and figure that out. And I was wondering then about your case. So in academia, you've got a, an ethics committee that will decide if someone could go undercover and it's very difficult. And I was gonna ask you about in journalism or at the Toronto Star, what's, what would be the equivalent? So it sounds like there were lawyers involved and yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think the bar for us is obviously much lower than you know going through an ethics committee um, and obviously there's a there's a hit a, a long history of kind of undercover reporting uh, to accomplish you know investigative pieces but that being said it's you know it's not a decision we take lightly at all um, it is very rare to use it as a, as a tool to tell the tell a story and really the two the, the criteria that you have to convince um, you know your lawyer and your your senior editors and managers is First of all, is there any other way to tell this story? Hmm. Um, and second of all, is there a compelling public interest to override, you know, something that's a key principle of our profession, which is that we are always transparent about who we are and why we are doing something. So right. you, know, you always identify yourself as a journalist, you always you know, reach out to all the parties and tell them what you intend to write about them. Um, those are all key tenants of our job, so we, we have to really have a strong Right. Um, Sorry, so if, I just, if I could just interrupt. Um, Sarah, I think you might be covering your microphone. Oh. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you so much. Um, so in terms of the story itself, there. I mean, it was a long piece and there's, there's so much information in it. Um, I mean, two things jump out, I think, for me anyways, uh, from the story. And one was the um, precariousness and complete lack of oversight of the temp industry, temp worker industry. 
and then just health and safety issues at this particular plan, how, how dangerous the place was and how they've been cited before and yet the problems continued. Um, which I would say, and I think you've mentioned this, uh, Sarah, yourself, in terms of the people listening, I think temp work uh, and even health and safety are two areas that are underrepresented in, in Canadian academia. Uh, at, at my school, we've tried to hire people in health and safety experts for a long time and weren't getting anyone applying. Um, so that certainly feels that could be, could be looked at. But um, I think you might have touched on this in your introduction there to the story, but um, I was wondering how, like it, so it turned into a story, an investigation about the temp industry um, and the seedy underworld that it's, that's involved in it. And I was going to ask you to what extent that was what you it started out as, uh, and I, it sounds like maybe it was really a, a story about temps at the beginning, or not. It was definitely a story about temps because I knew through my research, you know, leading up to going undercover, that there that most of the workers in this facility were hired through temp agencies, um, and you know, again, I I had a sort of um, Having read the academic research, I had a, a bit of a understanding of what the health and safety implications of that often were. And we knew that there was a record of temp workers dying at this particular facility. Um, what we didn't know um, and was, you know, um, the extent of the problem. We had no idea about what, you know, as you described, the kind of seedy underworld of temp agencies. That, that was one piece um, that we were not expecting. Um, the fact that I got paid to get, I was hired through a temp agency who, that I never met, um, that turned out to be an empty unit in a strip mall. Um, I was paid at a payday lender in cash, no pay stub. Those were elements of the story that we did not expect to find and pointed us to, you know, the broader problems in the temp agency sector in terms of how difficult it is to regulate this. You know, when we dug more into it, we found hundreds of examples of these agencies that are, are you know, not real addresses. You know, in one case, one of the registered addresses was an empty plot of land. Um, I found a number of temp agencies that were registered to my own building, One Young, where the Star Newsroom is. Um, so I just went up to the floor to see what was going on there, and it was just a reception desk. Um, so, you know, I, I think that going undercover really um, was useful in exploring that world, and I don't know that I would have been able to understand that side of the story had I not done that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, th I think we, we could spend an entire hour fireside chat on the Fiera food story alone. Um, but I do want to make sure we run, don't run out of time and we can get to some of the gig work stuff as well. But I want to, so another question that came in that I think maybe it fits here. Uh, someone asked whether you uh, have ever felt uh, unsafe or a fear for your own safety in, the, in your job. Uh, is that something you want you feel comfortable addressing and um, yes, yeah, and, um, you know, I think being a, a journalist often does come with some, some risk. There's definitely been, in the past, before I was on this beat, um, you know, I've covered protests that got heated, um, you know, I covered the elections in Kenya, uh, in 2013, I think it was, and, you know, there was some moment very heated moments there. Um, so there's definitely been times where I, I haven't felt completely safe. I'm very lucky to have received great training on that front, on hostile environment training and all of that. Um, the fear of food story, again, um, I remember before I, had, before I started the job, I interviewed someone off the record who had worked there and um, he sent me photos of his injury that he'd sustained and he sliced his finger off. And I remember my first day, like all I could think about was my finger getting sliced off. Um, and you know, it, it, it was, it, it was daunting. Um, and, and it, it didn't, you know, I often did 
to feel unsafe or uncertain about my my uh, working conditions there. You were there for, for a month? Yeah, a month. Wow. Um, but I, I think the hardest part was actually sort of the emotional piece of, you know, um, first of all, I'm, I'm forming relationships with people that I'm, I'm working with. And I know that I'm leaving. I know that I can, I can leave at any time, really. And they will be staying here and working in these conditions. Um, and that, that was, that piece was much more difficult than, you know, the concerns around my own safety. Well, that, that leads me to another question I wanted to ask you. And, and I was reading, or I can't remember if I read it or I heard him speak, but it was uh, Stephen Greenhouse, who's the famous uh, labor reporter at the New York Times, uh, was asked at one point whether uh, it's a challenge in his job or how he regulates um, when you're dealing with a story that makes you angry or sad, uh, like you're, you're, you're just describing, something that's personal. And then you have to write a story and you have to, by journalistic standards, maintain what he used, the words fairness and an objectivity. And I wonder about that. Is that a challenge? So you take fear of foods for it. When you went in there, there had already been a few deaths. And then there was another death, right? After, right soon after your story came out. Yeah. I've, since I worked there, there have been two deaths, two further deaths. Right. So you're, and you, as you said, you've got a connection to these people now. Hold on a second. I'll find that story here. Yeah. Um, when you're writing a story like this, do you, is it really hard to just, like I write on a blog and sometimes I'm obviously being snarky, <laughs> right? But I'm allowed to be because it's my personal blog, right? Um, but you can't do that. Is it a challenge for you to write these stories and not, or do you even feel you need to not come across as being angry? Um, yeah, that's, that's such an interesting question, I think, especially right now, because again, we're, we're having all these conversations about how mainstream media has often failed and continues to fail um, to address, you know, systemic racism and you know, all of these incredibly painful and infuriating issues. Um, and, you know, sort of asking what to, what is objectivity and who defines that? And for a long time in media, it's been straight, straight white men's definition of what is objectivity that, that has had sort of guided that principle. And there was a great piece by um, uh, Wesley Lowry, who's a, a, a black journalist uh, who works for 60 Minutes um, about sort of rethinking that and, and focusing more on um, a fairness and truth perspective on on telling stories as professional journalists and you know he says as journalists we have to be guided by moral clarity and for me that that totally resonates you know um i think journalists have to feel anger they they have to feel empathy they have to understand why certain issues are so painful and if you can't do that, you have no business telling that story. So yeah, I mean, I, I do feel anger and sadness over some of the things that I've seen firsthand. They're incredibly painful. Um, and, I, and I think it's wrong to erase that from your reporting. But I do think that the most, ultimately, the most powerful way for a journalist to tell a story, you know, our, our lawyer who, who just retired but was at the star for 50 years would always say show don't tell. And the fact is you don't need to tell readers what they should be angry and upset about. You present the facts, you, you describe, and readers will, un readers get it, you know, they'll feel, they'll feel an injustice that if an injustice exists, they will feel it through your presentation of the truth. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I think that emotion is, is part of the job. It doesn't diminish your responsibility as a journalist to be fair and truthful. Those are absolutely essential to what we do. Um, I think Columnists can, can, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Columnists can go off and have a stronger voice. Is that something you'd be interested in? 
which is writing a column where you can have your your own strong voice. Let's say whatever you like. No, I'm not, I'm not interested in, in opinion writing personally. Um, I love the process of investigating and again, presenting, showing and not telling. Mm -hmm. To me, that's super powerful. Um, I don't need, I, I don't think my personal opinions are really relevant. I think people want to hear from workers, from people who have the lived experience. Um, and my job as a journalist is to make space for that, but to, you know, dig for facts that present reality. Um, but I'm not really interested in, in you know, my, my own right. opinion on, on something. Some, you know, there's writers who are great at it and excel at it. It's just not my, my thing. Right. Okay, so um, I'm keeping an eye on the time here. The, I want to get to um, this issue of employment status, which is another area that you've spent a lot of time on. And for us, like, so for me, I'm, I'm a labor lawyer, and I've been at this for a long time. And this issue of the difference between an employee and an independent contractor, of course, is as old as employment law. Uh, you know, my mentor, Harry Arthur's, wrote uh, about the need for a dependent ca contractor category before I was born, incredibly. Um, and my first experience was actually um, when I was a, a master's of industrial relations student at the University of Toronto in 1990. I got a job uh, helping to organize taxi drivers in Toronto, some 5,000 taxi drivers. And of course the dispatch company said these are all independent contractors. Um, and then years, a few years later, when I was a lawyer, I had a case where I represented a taxi driver who had his throat slit. Um, and the issue in that case was whether he was entitled to claim workers' comp benefits. And the company said, no, he's an independent contractor. So these issues have been around in the law for a long time. But the, I think the emergence of the gig economy in really the, just the last decade has really uh, allowed that issue to become a public issue that people seem to understand. And of course, there you are again, right at the forefront of this reporting in Canada and bringing that issue. Um, and so you, you've written about the Uber drivers and then you really dug into Fedora. Um, and so for those of you, let um, me find it here, for those of you who are not Torontonians, Sarah has a podcast out that you should all go download um uh called hustled um on your favorite podcast provider uh it's a six-part series that's now done uh so you can listen to all six episodes but this follows the path of fedora drivers trying to organize a union now how did you get involved in that by the way how did how did like how did you get on to fedora um i i had a, a contact who kind of gave me the heads up about this union drive and sort of pointed out why it's so interesting um you know going back to our sort of our, our initial conversation i'm not focusing hugely on unions that's not to diminish the importance of that topic at all um it's more to say that you know i had being only one person, I had to make some kind of conscientious choices about where I was going to devote my energy. But, you know, obviously unions are such a, a key part of um, uh, looking at decent work standards. Um, and so, um, you know, this contract had sort of flagged why this was sort of an interesting and innovative attempt to uh, broaden the labor movement and expand the kind of umbrella uh, that the labor movement, the traditional labor, move, labor movement covers, um, and, and sort of an interesting example of organizing, a new way of organizing workers. Mm -hmm. and so um, that's what appealed to me about uh, this first story here about um, the, the start of the, labor, of the organizing drive amongst the Aura couriers, and you know they've they've really opened the door to to something, and um, and so yeah, that that sort of what our, our podcast focused on. And obviously you were a big part of painting a picture of why that, why this issue is so important. Um, but you know, it is, it's funny, 
um, <laughs> I, I, my editors love stories about the gig economy and it, it's often a bit of a battle to explain to them that this is actually, it's not new as many of them seem to think, you know, they see it as sort of a new shiny thing, but you know, it, it, to me, it's really just an extension of what I've been reporting on for years, which is precarious, precarious work. Yeah. Um, yeah, what, yeah. Uh, this happens to involve now. Was this the first time that, I think we only have about five minutes, so I'm gonna try and, I wanted a couple of, a couple of short questions I wanna ask you at the end, but I'm, I'm interested. Was this, because in journalism also gig work has a long history. Um, so I'm just wondering, had you really thought much about this employee versus independent contractor issue before you got into the whole gig economy or do you sudden, did it suddenly become an issue for you once you started talking to gig workers and couriers? No. I mean, I've been covering employee misclassification really since I started. And I remember actually one of my first kind of sit downs with you know, the Workers Action Center, but you know, one of the grassroots group groups pointed out how enormous this problem is. And at that time, you know, we were talking about cleaners, truck drivers, et cetera. Um, and so I'd done a number of stories on that front, you know, temp, you know, again, when I was doing a bunch of work on temp agencies, uh, temp, temp agencies sometimes tell attempts with their independent contractors. So it had it been something that had come up over and over again. Um, and, I, and I do think it's such a major feature of um, the way work has changed and the major feature of precarious work. So I had some familiarity with the issue, but I didn't have familiarity with, you know, how that interacts with technology and, and how companies kind of use technology as a way to say, like, you're not, you know, you're not my employee. Right. Yeah, so again, we could spend a lot of time talking about Fedora and Uber. There's a new big Uber case coming out this Friday that I assume you're all over. Uh, and so for those of you who, you know, again, haven't seen Sara's work, I suggest you go read some of the Fedora. This Fedora story and Sara's podcast are really of interest all around the world. Uh, I've had people from Australia who have listened to it and written to me about it, right? So it's a global issue and it's really interesting. And there's lots of areas that you could study in terms of academic stuff. And, and that's really, in our last few minutes, I wanted to ask you just a couple of questions that relate to the students here. And really just the, the main one I want to ask you, and I don't even know if you have an answer to this, but it's you've spent so much time on the ground dealing with labor issues now. And I wonder if you if you could sort of go back, if you could just take a sabbatical and go for a year or two or whatever, and just come back to school and study something. Is there something that you really think would be interesting you know if you're or another way of saying is what would you you know what would you study if you, if you could just go back or what do you think um really you, based on what you've learned where you would say you know what it would be really good if there was more work in this area is there anything that jumps out at you Ooh, i mean so Put you on spot i would love to, I would love to be able to go redo my master's. Sometimes I regret my my decision to not go the law route, and I would love to be, you know, if I were to have an, a second career in which money was no option and I could go to law school and be a labor lawyer, I think that would be a fascinating job. Um, I'd go back and be a journalist. <laughs> um, uh, I mean, I think probably if I was to go back and, you know, do a, a master's thesis or something, I would probably be focusing on health and safety issues for temp agency and migrant workers. I think, um, you know, one of the first slides you showed was uh, the investigation I did into General Electric and right. um, the, yeah, the, the cancer cluster that emerged um, from, from that factory. And what really struck me about that story was that, um, you know, obviously those workers had an enormous uphill battle to get compensation for their exposure to chemicals that made them sick, but um, they also had a union. They also, um, they were a community of workers that had such a strong bond with each other and had grown up with each other. 
you know, they were like family. And, and that was such a huge part of their ability to identify, record, um, uh, prove that, you know, they were exposed to all these dangerous substances and ultimately to, you know, to, to get some form of recognition for that. Um, and it just made me think of all the workers today who 20 years, 30 years down the line will be in a radically different position. You know, if you're a cleaner who has been uh, classified as an independent contractor your whole life and you've been working with chemicals your entire life, there's going to be no record of you getting sick. You may not even know any of your coworkers. Um, you know, how are you going to prove it further down the line when, when you start to experience health consequences? And so I think there's just such a, a lack of um, data really on, on things that, are, that will have tangible consequences on workers' life later on. Um, and, uh, that, that's scary to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, Derek, are we out yes. of time? Yeah, uh, we are in time now. Oh. <laughs> Importantly. So I don't know if there were questions coming in. I couldn't see any, so, but, uh. Yeah, actually I see no questions on PA and on chat. So yeah, I think it was pretty good. Okay. Okay. Uh, so, thank you, Sarah, very much for doing this. I know you're yeah. extremely busy. Yeah. Thank you very, very much, Professor David and Sarah, for this amazing oh, session. Cat. As a token of our appreciation, we are arranging for a delivery of fresh coffee beans to your homes from Coffee Ecology. Nice. These beans are ethically sourced and delivered by electrical vehicles. So now we are having a circuit breaker trivia and channel will be giving away some prizes. So please transition to our last room and stay tuned. Thank you so much, everyone. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.